call this thing to order. Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming on an absolutely gorgeous Friday afternoon. It's good to be here. Let me say up front, remind you that we have a reception afterwards upstairs on the ninth floor, so please join us for food and beverages. There is rumor that for the first time in C21 history there will be cheese curds. <laughs> <laughs> If you're, new, if you're new to Wisconsin and I don't get to try that delicacy, then you must come at least for a party. Um, it's really my pleasure to uh, introduce Canon Smith. Uh, I've known Canon since 2002 and uh, was a colleague of his at Maine State. I was chair of Maine State when we hired him. So really very happy and was really very devastated when he left Wayne State in 2006 to go to the University of Toronto. Um, I understood that I was, <laughs> I was devastated. Anyway, it's a pleasure to have Ken back here in Milwaukee with us. Uh, Karen got his BA from Oberlin College and um, in Ohio, uh, Miami University of Ohio is called the Cradle of uh, Football College. Well, Karen got his PhD from Indiana University, which is the cradle of Victorian studies. <laughs> um, he's the author of uh, two books, Alienation, that's two words, 19th century Gothic fiction and English nationality from uh, UPenn Press in 1997, and then just uh, 2009, Darwin in the Memory of the Human, Evolution, Savages in South America. He's also edited uh, collection called Victorian Investments, New Perspectives on Finance and Culture. And currently he's working on a project that is still taking its form. Uh, one piece of that we discussed at the Brown Bank today called Title Conrad, literally, uh, in published in Victorian Studies last year. And then the piece on uh, Stevenson today will be, probably be another portion of that. So without any further ado, Thanks, Richard. Uh, very kind of you to invite me. It's great to see all of you, many of you, for the second time today. Uh, I'll work on not repeating myself uh, too much. So I just have a short introductory section that tries to place this piece in the context of the project I'm working on right now. Uh, and then uh, I'll go on to the piece. The whole thing is about 42, 43 uh, minutes, depending on how many asides uh, I am able to insert. So uh, as it, the longer set in, realize that the end is nigh, and uh, that should leave sufficient time for a conversation, I, I hope, um, because as Richard says, the, the project is still very much uh, taking shape. Uh, this piece forms part of a project on what is to me the surprising intersection of the literal and the sea in 19th century British fiction. The stakes of the project are twofold. In the first instance, they're literary historical, building on and in some measure transforming Margaret Cohen's demonstration in her book, The Novel in the Sea, that the maritime and the marine have been central to the modern European novel from its inception in the early 18th century. The precise nature of that centrality has led me to a second set of claims about the pertinence of the literal, the denotative, and the technical. Although relentlessly and ubiquitously metaphorized then and now, the ocean in novels also stands for itself. So I could articulate one of my aims as attempting to explain the kind of critical purchase that can be provided by the following tautology. The ocean is the ocean. In an essay on Conrad's Heart of Darkness, which I talked about with some of you earlier today, I pursue the entailments of that tautology in connection with the literal. In this talk on Robert Louis Stevenson, the focus is on the technical, as the title may have given you a clue about. Uh, clearly, the main point of contact with the theme of changing climate has to do with the changing climate of uh, work and criticism and theory. But uh, I think there may be implications uh, for climate change which I have uh, left for the discussion, uh, if indeed that's something you want to talk about in the discussion. So the piece is called Technical Maturity in Robert Louis Stevenson. 
A number of technical lexicons about the novel have been developed, narratological, book historical, and sociological, to name just three of the most robust. More difficult to find are accounts or, or even examples of technical language in the novel. Likely reasons for this absence are ready to hand. To begin with the broad category of the literary, attempts to define such an elusive entity often hinge on contrasting it with the functional. For example, in a pronouncement that has been embraced far beyond the confines of its Russian formalist origins, Viktor Shklovsky distinguishes literary from practical language based on the perception of its structure. Shklovsky writes, the acoustical, articulatory, or semantic aspects of poetic language, and by poetic he means literary, may be felt. By implication, then, language that is not literary aspires to render the signifier transparent in hopes of providing unmediated access to the signified, an attempt that reaches its apotheosis in manuals like those for assembling IKEA furniture, which omit words entirely or almost entirely in favor of diagrams. Technical language is language on its way to the diagrammatic. Elaborated and deployed for its denotative capacity, it's practical with a vengeance, and thus, at least on Shklovsky's representation, essentially unliterary. There's an additional reason why the novel in particular might issue the technical. The modern European novel, a form of literary production that develops in conjunction with the increased leisure time and literacy of a burgeoning middle class, could be seen as inhospitable to technical language from its inception, insofar as that language might limit its market appeal. When we come to the Bildungsroman, the subgenre of the novel, that is my focus today, the incompatibility between novelistic and technical appears still more absolute. The fundamental cultural work of the novel of maturation is to reconcile individual desire with social necessity. Explaining the need for such reconciliation, Franco Moretti invokes Max Weber on the tragic split that the modern world has produced between life and profession. No longer can one aspire to discover a meaning for one's life in what one does for a living. As a consequence, what's true of the novel more generally also holds for the Bildungsroman. The complex and ever diversifying zone of the technical is banished, or nearly so. Not that the protagonists of Bildungsromans lack a profession. On the contrary, the search for one often proves key in these novels. But the more consequential apprenticeship from at least that of Goethe's Wilhelm Meister on 1795-96 is not to this or that line of work, but to life. As Moretti further observes, quote, to reach the conclusive synthesis of maturity, it's not enough to achieve objective results, like learning a trade or establishing a family. One must learn, first and foremost, to direct the plot of one's life so that each moment strengthens one's sense of belonging to a wider community. Accordingly, in canonical 19th century examples of the English language buildings or man, such as Charles Dickens's Great Expectations or Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, a successful transition to adulthood involves the nebulous accomplishment of social integration, whether by marriage, as in Jane's case, or penitential return to the once scorned home place, as in Pip's. It would be absurd to imagine Jane's maturity marked by fluency in Hindustani, or Pip's by mastery of marginal utility theory. In Stevenson's corpus, things are different. In those of his novels that can be considered Bildungsromans, and I'm going to talk about three today, the pivotal incidents all involve the learning and deployment of technical knowledge sedimented in a specialist lexicon. Stevenson's youthful protagonists, or his not so youthful protagonists who have aged without making a place for themselves in the world, achieve what I call a technical maturity. In contrast to the usual trajectory traced by the Bildungsroman, the impediments they face are only partly social. Although each of these characters must, like their numerous predecessors and descendants, negotiate a complex political, legal, and historical world, at decisive junctures, each also confronts the inhuman, in fact, the abiotic forces of winds, waves, and tides. Their transition to adulthood is enabled not by the repression or sublimation of individual desire, which is the usual route in the Bildungsroman, but by acquisition of the techniques and accompanying language required for the struggle with such forces. In short, they grow up when they commit to denotation. 
as a corollary, their bildung, their education, their development, is an equivocal one. Exempla of arrested development, these characters do not cross over into adulthood, but hover on its threshold. The maturity they achieve is also technical then, in the additional sense of lacking or still in progress. The biographical origins of this technical maturity are to be found in Stevenson's vocational ambivalence, born of having thrown over the family business of marine engineering for fiction writing. But the vexed attitude to the technical as at once indispensable and potentially insufficient provides critical purchase on the problem of what a novel ought to be at the end of the 19th century. Literary history has traditionally valorized the figural, non-technical, intransitive aspects of novels that might be approached otherwise, as though a novel should not do but mean. And literary study as such has insisted that something other, in fact, usually something conceptualized as something more than technical knowledge is at stake. But to grasp Stevenson's technical maturity is to bring into focus another history of the novel and to moot the possibility of an alternative vocation for literary study. That history would take stock of no novels engaged with work and the technical, particularly those turn-of-the-century texts that sought to harness fiction as a means not for transmitting technical knowledge, but for insisting on what that knowledge requires as its indispensable concomitant, love for the extra-fictional world in all its particularity and intractability. That vocation would involve an attempt on the part of literary scholars to realize what, in the Conrad essay, I call the facticity of fictional worlds. This entails recognizing the degree to which fictions, even romance, science fiction, fantasy, and magical realism, are structured, obviously in widely different ways, by an appeal to such things as geography, physical laws, and the denotative capacity of language. But it also requires attentiveness to the facticity of and in fiction in a more Sartrean sense. The constraints imposed on characters and readers by the thereness or the itness of a diegesis. So there are two sections of, uh, of the talk. Uh, the first one is called Pierre Perdu. Now that I've become a Canadian, I have to pretend that I can speak French. So there you go. Out in the North Sea, at roughly the same latitude as Dundee, 11 miles east of the Scottish mainland lies a reef known alternately as Inch Cape or the Bell Rock. Submerged for all but the lowest points of the ebb in each tidal cycle, it's been the cause of hundreds, maybe thousands of shipwrecks. In testimony before a committee of the House of Commons on the need for a light, Robert Stevenson instanced the fact that the Bell Rock lies, quote, on a track which is annually navigated by no less than 700,000 tons of shipping besides His Majesty's ships of war and revenue cutters. And the testimony was made um, during the Napoleonic War. So the fact that uh, ships of war uh, traverse this area is particularly important. A bill for a loan to pay for a light was passed in 1806. And the commissioners of Northern Lighthouses hired Stevenson, who began construction in 1807. Three years later, the structure was complete. 116 feet tall, its base awash, as you can see here in this picture, still standing after two centuries of enduring blows from waves with a maximum recorded force in excess of 3,000 pounds per square foot. The Bell Rock Lighthouse was painted on commission by J.M.W. Turner. This is Turner. He, he never actually saw it. He, he painted this without having seen the light. So it's, it's Turner's imagination of what it might look like. And more recently, included together with the Brooklyn Bridge and the Panama Canal in a BBC series that came out in 2003 called The Seven Wonders of the Industrial World. This is one. Robert Stevenson's son, Thomas, designed, built, or assisted in building more than 30 lighthouses himself, as well as inventing a new way of illuminating them more brightly. For three years in the summer and early fall, from 1868 to 1870, Robert Louis Stevenson, Thomas's son and Robert's grandson and namesake, was stationed up and down the Scottish coast to begin his study of engineering in the field. But in the spring of 1871, not long after presenting a paper, this is Robert Louis Stevenson, presenting a paper to the Scottish Royal Society of the Arts, quote, on a new form of intermittent light for lighthouses, unquote, he told his father he wanted to be a writer. 
That desire was not to be satisfied at once. First came reading law at Edinburgh University and then the bar to which he was admitted in 1875. He never practiced law, but he went through the steps. Uh, engineering, however, was definitively left behind. The last part of this story is a very familiar one for anyone who works on Stevenson, a staple of Stevenson biographies. Uh, Jenny Calder opens her still influential RLS, A Life Study, which was published in 1980, with it, as though the discussion between father and son on April 8, 1871 were the key to her, her subject's entire life. Without dwelling on the particulars of what Stevenson's father and grandfather did for a living, though, neither the magnitude nor the implications of his decision to abandon a career in engineering can be appreciated. No garden variety Oedipal rebellion against the paternal script, the refusal to take his appointed place as a marine engineer building public works was tantamount to turning away from what was seen, and I think arguably correctly seen, as a heroic struggle with colossal natural forces in salutum omnium, which is the Latin motto of the Scottish Northern Lighthouse Board, which means uh, for the safety of all. Stevenson's letters, essays, and memoirs treat this break in two antithetical ways. On one hand, he makes light of the achievements of his forebears, blithely transforming the tools of their trade into raw material for fiction. In an 1888 article in Scribner's, with the ironic title, The Education of an Engineer, he tabulates the results of his field work as follows. What I gleaned, I am sure I do not know. But I indeed, indeed, I already had my own private determination to be an author. I loved the art of words and the appearances of life, and travelers and headers and rubble and polished ashlar and Pierre Perdue and even the thrilling question of the string course interested me only, if they interested me at all, as properties for some possible romance or as words to add to my vocabulary. Making common cause with his non-specialist readers, Stevenson decontextualizes the terminology of marine engineering, repurposing what Conrad would later call the clearness, precision, and beauty of perfected speech into so much sonorous innuendo. That he's able to do so gives the lie to Shklovsky's distinction between literary and practical language. Because although eminently practical, to the extent that these terms of art are not readily understood, it is precisely and perhaps only their acoustical, articulatory, or semantic aspects that may be felt. From the outside, technical language is poetry. And this is the point you were making about Beckett, I think, <laughs> earlier today. This is the Stevenson who took the romance side of the realism debate with Henry James and Walter Bizant in the mid-1880s, firmly dividing life from art and identifying the joy of childhood reading with a voluptuous immersion in language divorced from meaning. Stevenson writes in an essay called A Gossip on Romance about uh, what good books are in childhood. And uh, he says, the words, if the book be eloquent, should run thenceforward in our ears like the noise of breakers. Uh, they become white noise <laughs> in this estimation. It is also the Stevenson who, writing from Wick in September 1868 during the first of his three seasons in the field, posed questions that betrayed what must have been for the formidable father who was to answer them, a maddeningly cavalier attitude to the factual. Uh, I mean, remember, so the, the son of, uh, and grandson of uh, these historical engineers of heroic proportions, and also someone who had been studying engineering at Edinburgh University already, uh, he writes in one letter, what is the weight of a square foot of salt water? And how many pounds are there to a ton? <laughs> uh, Stevenson, the bohemian the romancer, the author of light fiction, the European wanderer in the South Pacific. This figure is familiar, not least because of his own efforts to construct it in essays, prefaces, and letters. But there's another Stevenson, one with a suspicion that Pierre Perdue might be valuable for more than their potential as properties in romance. Here he is in a letter to his friend, William Lowe, written from Samoa in January, 1894. Stevenson writes, I think of the Renaissance fellows and their all-round human sufficiency and compare it with the ineffable smallness of the field in which we labor and in which we do so little. I ought to have been able to build lighthouses and write 
David Balfour's too, David Balfour, the title of uh, a novel of his. Hink Eli Lacrimae, Latin for uh, whence those tears. In the same self-deprecating vein, a poem from the 1887 collection Underwoods proposes that the most generous estimate of his writing should view it as a childish task to which a strenuous family, having completed its adult daytime work, addresses its evening hours. Or again, in the unfinished and posthumously published records of a family of engineers, Stevenson recounts of his father, on Tweed side or by line or manner, we have spent together whole afternoons. To me at the time, extremely wearisome. To him, as I'm now sorry to think, bitterly mortifying. The river was to me a, pr a, very, a pretty and various spectacle. I could not see, I could not be made to see it otherwise. To my father, it was a checkerboard of lively forces, which he traced from pool to shallow with minute appreciation and enduring interest. Thus he poured over the engineer's voluminous handy book of nature. Thus must too have poured my grandfather and uncles. The poem's distinction between two kinds of tasks, infantile and adult, is here refigured as a distinction between two modes of vision, one restricted to the surface and appropriate to aesthetics, the other penetrating and appropriate to mechanics or physics. Stevenson laments that he could not be made to adopt the latter. In her 2009 book, Robert Louis Stevenson in the Pacific, Rosalind Jolly adduces moments such as this one to substantiate the contention that Stevenson experienced quote, a sense of his own inadequacy in comparison to his father and his father's achievements. She treats 1887, the year that his father died and the year before he was to depart permanently for the Pacific, as the beginning of a new phase in his career, when he tried to make writing matter in the way that engineering does, as a way to have a direct effect on the world. Jolly finds the results of this new sense of writing as action in travel narratives and in political letters to the Times about the condition of Samoa. In a way, she writes, proposing a moment of close congruity between writer and engineer, son and father, grandson and grandfather, the letters to the Times were his lighthouses, works of professional skill and public service. Jolly's compelling and meticulously researched study complicates most received ideas about Stevenson, documenting a late turn to nonfiction as a form of interventionist activist writing. But Stevenson was always interested in the connections between writing and action in the world, before and after 1887, and in his fiction, no less than in his nonfiction. Still, the novels are not exactly his lighthouses, despite requiring professional skill and sometimes conceived of as public service. From Treasure Island on, Stevenson's fiction does not betray a wish to transmute writing into either activism or engineering. Instead, in its pages, technical knowledge and the necessity for possessing it and putting it to work prove central to plots and characters as well as to readers' experience. If these fictions are not lighthouses or even manuals for building lighthouses, they are instead manuals for how to adopt an attitude appropriate to engineers and sailors, representative grown-ups in Stevenson's world. They are richly connotative and figurative peons to the denotative, the literal, and the technical. Paradoxically, given its superficial resemblance to the stratagems of one or another version of literary realism, just this devotion to the literal and technical, um, the insistence that Stevenson had on putting maps in his novels, uh, providing bizarrely the exact coordinates in longitude and latitude of imaginary islands, uh, making readers wade through technical terminology and Scots dialect without uh, footnotes he had, a, uh, a long uh, argument with his publisher about providing notes on Scott's dialect, and he said, absolutely not. I'm just going to give it to them. If they're English, tough. They have to work through it. Uh, just this resemblance to the stratagem of literary realism is undoubtedly part of what has kept Stevenson from being granted the stature of a great Victorian novelist. Ian Duncan, discussing that slight, has gone so far as to state that, quote, Stevenson, however brilliant an author of prose fiction, did not write novels, unquote. He explains the soundness of that deliberately perverse claim by adding the clarifi clarification, he didn't write novels according to the ways in which the genre 
came to be defined and its ascetic norms established in the retrospective view of 20th century criticism. Seen as a failing as many have seen it, the refusal to produce a Victorian novel along recognized lines has condemned Stevenson to the status of a second-rate artist at best. Recognized as a canny strategy, as Duncan suggests it must have been, demonstrates that Stevenson's fictions function as critiques of the novel as usual, of its form, its dominant ideologies, and the contours of the world that it bodies forth in its pages. From one angle, that critique looks like a departure, a move away from the three-volume multi-plot novel and toward modernism. From another, it could productively be understood as a return. Thinking about the technical in particular, Stevenson's descent from the canons of mid-Victorian novelistic production enables him to revisit and develop a signal aspect of the novel as incarnated in an early 18th century text like Defoe's Robinson Crusoe. A focus not on character interiority, but on character exteriority, a character's ability to get something done in the world of the fiction. As Stevenson points out in an essay called Child's Play, quote, Crusoe was always at makeshifts and had, in so many words, to play at a great variety of professions. And then the book is all about tools, quote. Jury rigging, trying out multiple professions, uh, attention lavished on tools and the technical, these are characteristics that Robinson Crusoe shares with what Stevenson elsewhere calls romance, which he describes as fiction where the interest turns, quote, not upon what a man shall choose to do, but on how he manages to do it, not on the passionate slips and hesitations of the conscience, but on the problems of the body and of the practical intelligence. In her remarkable The Novel and the Sea, Margaret Cohen treats maritime fiction as the exemplary form of the sort of novel intimately bound up in the problems of the body and practical intelligence. For Cohen, that fiction beginning with Robinson Crusoe itself is above all about work and committed to modes of narration that compel characters and readers alike to immerse themselves in the techniques and terminology of the work of sailing. Maritime fiction is therefore less concerned with achieving a plausibility of mimesis, a criterion we might apply to realist fiction, than a plausibility of performance, description that convincingly renders successful actions in situations of crisis. Understanding how things work, knowing how to make them work, to achieve something in the world, these practical, manual, technical concerns become, in Cohen's revised history of the novel, as much a part of the European and North American novelistic tradition as psychological realism's nuanced parsing of desire and affect and motive. Stevenson's Bildungsromans unfold as a series of trials in which, as he claims about romance and as Cohen claims about maritime fiction, the point is how the protagonist manages to do it to escape from a tidal island, to prevent a schooner from being blown out to sea, to convincingly impersonate a first mate. But in each case, character's performance under duress is linked to what a man shall choose to do, quote unquote. Thus, although some of these texts have been dismissed as sheer fantasy, and others celebrated as gritty realism, which is the 20, generally the 21st century view, that, um, these amazing late Pacific novellas, uh, the ebb tide, uh, uh, seen as the height of Stevenson's work, uh, early so-called uh, boys' fiction like Treasure Island uh, discounted, uh, or vice versa. In the 19th century, this estimate was completely reversed. So, so Oscar Wilde quips, uh, I see that romantic surroundings are the worst possible surroundings for a romantic writer. <laughs> when Stevenson moves to Samoa, his fiction goes to pot, as far as Wilde is concerned. Uh, even though these texts have been celebrated or condemned uh, uh, for being different from one another, all are, in fact, hybrid fictions that turn the how of child's play into the decisive step in accommodating oneself to the world, and more surprisingly, in accommodating the world to oneself. Stevenson's novels of education and growth add to the protagonist's ability to reflect the world, which is standard in the modern Bildungsroman, the surprising ability to affect it, an ability born of affection for it, to develop one must learn to change the world. To change the world, one must know it and the names for its parts. To know it, one must love it. So runs the credo of these fictions. Part one. Part two is called Making a Sweetheart of One's Compass. 
Of the three Stevenson novels I'll treat in some detail, Kidnapped most closely approximates to a conventional Bildungsroman. Just as Walter Scott does in Waverly, Stevenson sends his protagonist, David Balfour, on an expedition into the alien territory of the Scottish Highlands. A lowlander and not, like Edward Waverly, an Englishman, David nonetheless initially shows a similar ignorance of Highland conditions and mores and eventually arrives at a similar regard for them. Education thus structures kidnapped in its entirety, but it's not an amorphously conceived education in the ways of the world. It's a specific education in the particularities of Highland life. Already then, the familiar plan of the Bildungsroman has been altered by way of a detour through the assimilation of ethnographic details that can't possibly be considered universally necessary for maturation. But the more curious departure has to do with the novel's tracing of a properly technical apprenticeship in the properties of and the nomenclature associated with vessels under sail, reefs, currents, and tides. Coming to understand and to name such phenomena plays a fundamental role in David's transition to adulthood, something indicated by the nature of his first-person narration. The adult narrators of first-person retrospective buildings or mons typically achieve distance from their childlike selves with interpolations from the narrating present into the narrated past that emphasize the difference in perspective between the two times. Early in Dickens's Great Expectations, for instance, Pip comments on his impression of a hulk, uh, a prison ship, anchored in the Medway River in southeastern England. Uh, this is Pip in Great Expectations. Cribbed and barred and moored by massive rusty chains, the prison ship seemed in my young eyes to be ironed like the prisoner, uh, Magwitch. Pip manages to have his anthropomorphism and disavow it too. The evocative description of a hulk as ironed like the prisoner is achieved at the same time that the adult narrator censures its metaphoricity as a youthful perceptual error. According to the early sections of Great Expectations, to be a child is to be at the mercy of the figural. Part of growing up involves learning to use the figural for one's own ends, an ability the narrated Pip lacks at the outset and comes to possess over the course of the novel. Notable about Kidnapped is the degree to which such interpolations on the part of the older narrating David differentiate past from present, child from adult, on the basis of strictly technical knowledge. For example, after his uncle Ebenezer, having tried and failed to kill him, arranges for him to be kidnapped, whence the title, and sold into slavery, David comments not on the revelation provided as to the treachery of other people or the unforeseeable contingency, contingencies of fate, but actually on the course of the covenanter, the brig in which he's being held. This is David. I could see the sunset still quite bright. This, at such an hour of the night, surprised me greatly, but I was too ignorant to draw the true conclusion that we were going north about round Scotland and were now on the high sea between the Orkney and the Shetland Islands, having avoided the dangerous currents of the Pentland Firth. To be an adult, the older David suggests, is to know how to navigate. A closely related conclusion is implied by his account of being thrown overboard with the Covenanter is wrecked on the Torin Rocks, an area of submerged reefs interspersed among small islands located due south of the Ross of Mull in western Scotland. He's saved from drowning not by his own exertions, but by a tidal current, as he explains at length while once more providing retrospective clarification. While I was hailing the brig, I spied a tract of water lying between us where no great waves came, but which yet boiled white all over and bristled in the moon with rings and bubbles. What it was, I had no guess, which for the time increased my fear of it. But I now know it must have been the roost or tide race, which carried me, had carried me away so fast and tumbled me about so cruelly, and at last, as if tired of that play, had flung out me and the spare yard, onto which he's hanging, upon its landward margin. Long before Bruno Latour's theorization of distributed agency, Stevenson takes pains to dramatize the power of abiotic forces in co-determining how the life of the individual unfolds. In a world where such forces have as much control over one's fate as one's own actions do, arriving at correct nomenclature is essential to growing up. 
But more essential still is learning how things work. The pivotal episode of Kidnapped, understood as a Billingsroman, immediately follows on this wreck of the Covenanter. The tide race washes David ashore on a small island. Uh, I don't actually have much of a Scots, an understanding of, of uh, what Scots pronunciation is, but uh, the internet is a wonderful thing. And even though it's not spelled like this, you'll see how it's spelled in a minute. Apparently, Erich is how it's supposed to be said. So, Erich, where Stevenson himself lived for a time in 1870, during part of the building of Dub Artak, a lighthouse constructed by his father and his uncle David Stevenson to prevent real world ships from following the fictional Covenanter to the bottom. In sight of the mainland, but unable to swim across to it, David nearly starves to death. Some fishermen pass close by, but only laugh at his desperate cries for help and sail away again. But the fishermen return the next day, and with only three words of comprehensible English interspersed among their Scots Gaelic, the words are whatever, yes, and tide, <laughs> convey the open secret of the island's tidal nature. David reflects on his escape as follows. A seabred boy would not have stayed a day on Erich, which is only what they call a tidal islet, and except in the bottom of the neeps, can be entered and left twice in every 24 hours, either dry shot or at the most by wading. Even I, who had the tide going out and in before me in the bay, and even watched for the ebbs, the better to get my shellfish, which is all he had to eat. Even I, I say, if I'd sat down to think instead of raging at my fate, must have soon guessed the secret and got free. Tidal islet, the bottom of the neeps, twice in every 24 hours, ebbs. The passage fairly bristles with technical marine terminology, emphasizing the difference between a boy who almost dies of starvation, when he can easily walk to safety, and a knowledgeable man looking back on his own earlier tragicomic ignorance. But these reflections also reveal that the terms themselves are not actually of the essence. Escape requires only a basic understanding of the tidal cycle as it affects Erich which the narrating David claims his younger narrated self could have come to unaided, if only for the right approach. Quote, if I had sat down to think instead of raging at my fate. It's not officially part of the talk, but so N.C. Wyeth uh, uh, did uh, these famous illustrated versions in the early 20th century of uh, Stevenson novels. And here's uh, one of his illustrations from uh, Kidnap. To me, it's really remarkable for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, it's the only illustration that I could find in which nothing is happening. <laughs> Here's a person standing, it's David, looking out at the water, but there's no action whatsoever. All the action is inside. Um, and so for me, the second remarkable thing is, in a way, Wyeth has confirmed what I'm uh, trying to suggest David is saying, that uh, what's lacking here is the right approach. Uh, it doesn't require technical uh, terminology. What it requires is an attention to the world around you, which is what we see why I'm trying to, to capture here in the picture, the painting. The Erich episode of Kidnapped opens with a technical failure, a shipwreck attendant on the inability to navigate successfully. Punctuated by human subjection to natural forces and an intrusion from the retrospective narrator about the names for those forces, it turns at last on a simple but potentially fatal failure of understanding. Resolution comes in the form of a tidal epiphany. The Appen murder, the flight across the heather with Alan Breck Stewart, the return to the family estate of Shaw's, all of this remains to be narrated. But success at all is enabled by success on Erich, not because of any concrete knowledge gained, but because of the conviction that such knowledge is necessary and the embrace of an attitude that will make it possible. The question of an appropriate attitude to life returns in the late Pacific novella, The Ebb Tides, 1894, with the crucial addition of the necessity, not simply of attention to the checkerboard of forces that make up the world, but of love for it. The Ebb Tides' first sentence, uh, really shocking to me, uh, coming to the novella after having read Treasure Island and Kidnapped and not at all understanding what's coming in Stevenson's career, is this. Throughout the island world of the Pacific, scattered men of many European races and from almost every grade of society carry activity and disseminate disease. <laughs> what happened to Jim Hawkins in Treasure Island? The rest of the novella develops the grim expose of Europeans' presence in the Pacific promised by this opening. 
centering on three such scattered men. Wish, a depraved Cockney, Davis, a disgraced American ship captain, and Herrick, Oxford educated but otherwise a universal failure. All three, but especially Herrick, through whom the narrative is largely focalized, instantiate the metaphorical decline broached in the novella's title, The Ebb Tide. At the, outside, Herrick in an e uh, sorry, at the outset, Herrick, in an echo of David's predicament on Erich, finds himself near starvation in Tahiti. In the telling South Sea phrase, the narrator reports he was on the beach, washed up without a source of support or the prospect of one. The narrator identifies the cause in a terse, single-sentence diagnosis. Quote, bearing no interest in his duties, he brought no attention, unquote. The first half of the novella chronicles a final effort to avert death or imprisonment, the theft of a schooner accomplished with his two down-and-out companions. Early in that effort, the role to be played by the technical can be glimpsed when Herrick, introduced to the South Pacific crew of the schooner as first mate, must start giving commands. Quickly exhausting the vocabulary that can be derived from, quote, his reminiscences of sea romance, he whispers an urgent request to Davis, for heaven's sake, tell me some of the words. Again, though, the words themselves are not the point. At issue, rather, is the close observation, commitment, and care that a technical lexicon, like nautical terminology, requires and bears witness to. Herrick doesn't lack correct terminology so much as interest and attention. Thus, the narrator's account of his first watch aboard the schooner as it crosses open water. He took two steps forward and remembered his dead reckoning. How has she been heading, he thought, and he flushed from head to foot. He had not observed or had forgotten. Here was the old incompetence. The slate must be filled up by guess. Never again, he vowed to himself in silent fury. Never again. It shall be no fault of mine if this miscarry. And for the remainder of his watch, he read the face of the compass as perhaps he had never read a letter from his sweetheart. <laughs> that line is the beginning of this piece. <laughs> when I read that, uh, uh, to me it's kind of staggering. And, and I had to talk about what's going on here. He read the face of the compass as perhaps he had never read a letter from his sweetheart. Although spelled as though it were a synonym for deceased, dead in dead reckoning, actually derives from the word deduced. Uh, dead reckoning or deduced reckoning originally is a mode of navigation in which a vessel's uh, speed and heading, the elapsed time of a given leg, leg of its journey, and the effects of winds or currents are taken into account to arrive at an estimate as to the path of its movement over the surface of the water. Learning this navigational technique, but more crucially, adopting an attitude of love for the world and for the denotative that tries to point to that world stands as the necessary beginning to Herrick's process of extricating himself from the old incompetence, cause and symptom of an inability to grow up. To read the face of the compass as he had never read a letter from his sweetheart, this is devotion, and not to a bald, self-evident fact, but exactly as in the case of love letters as well, to facts or data as they figure in a complex process of interpretation or estimation. What's really being signified here is the question both in relation to the compass and in relation to the love letter. Technical language, technical knowledge, and devotion to the denoted figure centrally in Kidnapped and the Ebb Tide. But the most elaborate meditation on the technical and its place in the protagonist's buildung appears in Treasure Island which at first glance seems to reverse the values evident in the other texts. At the end of the opening section of the novel, Jim Hawkins takes the map of the eponymous island to a local landowner, Squire Trelawney, and another representative of the ruling classes, Dr. Livesley. And together they outfit an expedition to recover the buried treasure to which the map is supposed to provide directions. But Trelawney, from the outset, is depicted as a flawed member of the squirearchy. In particular, Treasure Island lampoons his penchant for literal interpretation. Um, and it makes no sense, it has to be reproduced at too much length, uh, but there's a back and forth that he has with the captain that he's hired uh, to pilot the, the schooner Hispaniola, and uh, over and over again, the captain uses figurative language which Trelawney interprets literally. That Trelawney has evidently paid too much for the Hispaniola, and inadvertently signed on an assortment of pirates to serve his crew, indicates some of the implied consequences of his literal mindedness. 
The novel also questions the use of terms of art in contexts that don't require them. As when Livesey, having briefly taken over the narration from Jim Hawkins, gives the time as about half past one, before needlessly adding three bells in the sea phrase. They're not actually at sea when he's writing this. They're, they're on the island. And so to say three bells is nonsense. It, it, it's, a, it's a way of keeping time which makes sense on board ship, but, but not otherwise. Uh, this is a kind of affectation that strips away rather than adds meaning, an insight conveyed more pointedly by way of Long John Silver's parrot, who shrieked command, stand by to go about, produces technical language devoid of intentionality or application. Uh, to me, there's an incredible echo of the, the parrot that uh, von Humboldt was supposed to have encountered in South America, which uh, was the only remaining speaker of an extinct indigenous language. That, uh, a lot of work on Humboldt's parrot and whether or not it existed, but uh, uh, these parrots that preserve uh, human language apart from human intentionality uh, uh, seem to be something that uh, cycled back uh, through obsessively in various 19th century texts, Long John Silver's. Uh, one of these. Literal interpretation is misinterpretation, nautical terminology gibberish. Such appears to be the judgment of this novel, a judgment perfectly suited to the Stevenson, who wrote that the specialized terms requisite to designing and building lighthouses interested me only if they interested me at all as properties for some possible romance. In Treasure Island, though, the attack on the misapplication of the literal and technical allows for a nuanced consideration of what might be their right uses. When first reading the map of the island, for instance, the instructions for finding the treasure, which are given in compass bearings and fathoms, are incomprehensible to Jim, even as they filled the squire and Dr. Livesey with delight. Being unable to understand the import of, quote, bearing a point to the north of north-northeast, unquote, means being blind to the world and the possibilities that it contains. Accordingly, Jim's tutelage by Long John Silver focuses on the ways of the sea, and begins on their first outing together. This is Jim. On our little walk along the Bristol Keys, he made himself the most interesting companion, telling me about the different ships that we passed, their rig, their tonnage, their nationality, and explaining the work that was going forward. And every now and then telling me some little anecdote of ships or seamen, or repeating a nautical phrase, till I'd learned it perfectly. Moreover, like David Balfour's in Kidnapped, Jim's retrospective narration marks his accession to adulthood by putting to use a wide range of nautical terminology, from a description of the Hispaniola at anchor in still water as mirrored, quote, from the truck to the water line, unquote, to the offhand observation that an especially tall tree might have been entered as a sailing mark upon the chart. Distinct from Livesey's gratuitous use of nautical terminology, the correct deployment of truck and the quick estimate of a land feature suitability for use as a sailing mark function in the novel as confirmation that the Jim who tells the tale has outgrown the younger self about which he's telling. As in both Kidnapped and the Ebb Tide, in Treasure Island that confirmation is encapsulated in an episode of effective action combined with appropriate use of technical language. Jim's reclaiming of the Hispaniola, which had been captured by pirates soon after the expedition dropped anchor. Extending over several chapters in the fifth section of the novel, the episode is condensed to its essence in a final decisive act. Having boarded the Hispaniola, sailed it to safety under the direction of the sole surviving pirate left on board, named Israel Hands, run it aground, again, under Hands's directions, and then killed Hands. And here's another wife illustration of this one for Treasure Island of this uh, moment when Jim kills Israel Hand. So th th these are typically the kind of moments that Wyeth chooses uh, to depict here. A, a, a still moment in a scene otherwise of a lot of actions. That's what to me makes David on Erich such a strange painting. Uh, having done all this, Jim suddenly perceives that he must take action to prevent the schooner from being blown back out to sea. And uh, here's his narration of this event. I began to see a danger to the ship. The jibs I speedily doused and brought tumbling to the deck. But the mainsail was a harder matter. Of course, when the schooner canted over, the boom had swung outboard. And the cap of it and a foot or tail of two of sail hung even under the water. I thought this made it still more dangerous. Yet the strain was so heavy 
that I half feared to meddle. At last, I got my knife and cut the halyards. The peak dropped instantly. A great belly of loose canvas floated broad upon the water. And since, pull as I liked, I could not budge the downhaul. That was the extent of what I could accomplish. For the rest, the Hispaniola must trust to luck, like myself. Like polished ashlar or string course to the non-engineer, like ebbs in the bottom of the neeps to someone unfamiliar with the tides, to the non-sailor, the words canted, boom, cap, halyards, peak, and downhaul are either sheer sensuous pleasure or nonsense to be skipped. But if one does understand them or takes the trouble to look them up and think them through, they also denote. They describe a problem a ship that has been deliberately run aground might reasonably face, and they perfectly realize in prose one solution to that problem. In doing so, they don't establish the verisimilitude of the diegesis so much as attest to the dual capacity of the intradiegetic narrator at once to solve the problem and to use the language requisite to narrating that solution. Viewed thus, the advent of these technical terms in the narrative marks a moment of bildung, achieved in the present of the doing and confirmed in the retrospect of the telling, a moment that requires and provides evidence of devotion to the recalcitrant, the particular, the actual. Elsewhere, reader, I married him. In Stevenson, the jibs I speedily doused. Two paragraphs of conclusion. Technical maturity thus stands counter to the fixity to which a terminal wedding attests in a more conventional buildings or mon. The incomplete nature of technical maturity, that is, results from the displacement of heterosexual romance by romance with the world. To read the compass as one has never read a letter from one's sweetheart. To mark one's achievement of adulthood by the announcement not of a wedding, but of the saving of a schooner. Such moments crystallize the cathexis of the technical so completely that it may be superfluous to give the additional evidence of Stevenson's statements in Records of a Family of Engineers that, quote, the joy my grandfather felt in his career was strong as the love of woman, unquote. In Stevenson's Buildings Romans, love for the world, such as engineers and sailors possess, is required and transmitted in contexts of male homosociality, from which women are almost entirely absent. The development such love promises taking place outside the orbit of any heterosexual romance plot resists the telos of such a plot. Of the three protagonists that I've been considering, only David Balfour achieves manhood, but in a sequel that chronicles his courtship and marriage as well as his education in the law. Not in Kidnapped itself. The open-ended, inconclusive nature of these protagonists' buildum, therefore, indicates less their failure to mature than Stevenson's refusal of the model of personhood on offer in the traditional Bildungsroman. That refusal spills beyond the pages of fiction. Duncan notes that, in the opinion of many early 20th century critics, it was Stevenson himself who never became an adult. He remained a kind of literary lost boy, adept at puerile forms, but never mastering the mature complexities of the novel. But Stevenson might well have taken this slur as a compliment. The passage he wrote in Records of a Family of Engineers about his grandfather's love of the world and of the work that took him out into the world continues, underscoring the endurance of that love across all the stages of his life. And this is Stevenson on his grandfather's love. It lasted him through youth and manhood. It burned strong in age. And at the approach of death, his last yearning was to renew these loved experiences, building lighthouses. What he felt himself, he continued to attribute to all around him. And to this supposed sentiment in others, I find him continually, almost pathetically appealing, often in vain. In their commitment to technical detail, Stevenson's Bildungsromans take up and transform that appeal, carrying on the family business after all. Thank you. Yes, I'm happy to uh, feel, feel better. You don't have to. Uh, yeah.
be it should be here between the questions. Not as though we're in an auditorium yet. But I think that I want to ask you about the relation to the American context, where it seems to me that novels of technical attention are quite common and not just novel narratives. I mean, uh, and buildings are not tech narratives. So I mean, Ben Franklin is made out of technical procedures. Uh, Melville is very novel, highly technical. Uh, Jack London's obsessed with how to kill a seal and live on it all, which are long in Antarctica. Uh, yeah. So I'm wondering what the you know, what you see is the difference between a, a British tradition where in, in your presentation this is a rather new and um, maybe defiant move by the standards of uh, Victorian fiction and in the United States where it almost seems to be one of the major norms. And yeah, I mean that's a great point and I think there is uh, clearly a difference in national traditions here. Um, although, I mean, it's precisely the maritime novel which travels back and forth so that uh, uh, Cooper's uh, The Pilot becomes this sort of similar moment in relation particularly to Scott's The Pirate. And the, the crossing back and forth of those uh, novels spawns the 19th century maritime tradition in, in both national contexts. Um, I don't know enough about Franklin to go back to that part. Uh, you know, I, Melville and Wolfe, uh, not Wolfe, I'm thinking of the same Wolfe, Melville and London, um, you know, from what I understand of the reception of Melville, the technical is a problem for you. I mean, Moby Dick, uh, the reception of Moby Dick is highly problematic, partly because of Melville's refusal to let the technical go, so that the way in which, in this kind of proto Joycean way, he freights all of the technical details with this metaphorical overlay is impossible for a lot of It's short term problematic, long term at yeah. the stages. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, right. Uh, you know, so I think the, not in London's case, but certainly in Melville's case, the technical is there, but it also is, is serving a non technical function. I think that uh, in Moby in particular, maybe in some of the other uh, South Sea romances, in fact, he, uh, I don't know if the technical, in the way that it is, or I'm arguing it is for Stevenson, is itself, but that the technical sort of figures something else. Mm -hmm. uh, in London, I think that's not the case, but I think London is coming uh, uh, in the wake of uh, certainly uh, uh, Stevenson, Conrad, something like the Sea Wolf, or London's nonfiction writing on, on sailing, show this kind of devotion to the technical, uh, which I think is part and parcel of what's happening. Uh, with Stevenson, with, uh, with Childers in the Riddle of Sands in the late 19th and early 20th century, which is this turn to uh, the possibility of technical maturity. And there's this uh, locked off coda to this piece on Stevenson, in which I talk about the Sea Wolf and I talk about the Riddle of the Sands as um, two other novels in which we see the same pattern repeated. Yeah. Uh, is, it, is it related to naturalism then, 1880s, 1890s? It's a little early for the US, but you know. The other place where technical stuff does show up in the British tradition is, yeah. you know, Thomas Hardy, How Do You Kill a Pig, here in yeah. the steps, right? And of course, the American naturalists are totally obsessed with process. Yeah. I think, that, and I think it's much maybe truer for somebody like Norris, even than mm -hmm. for Hardy. I mean, it's a, we don't really know how to kill a pig. We know that it's, yeah. <laughs> that's gruesome really really and Jude doesn't want to do it. Cool. But, uh, <laughs> you know, there, there isn't this sense that we, we ought to figure out the stepwise details in the way that I think. You know, how can you make sense of these moments in Stevenson, right. and, or in the Sea Wolf, or, or, or in the Riddle of Sands, without following the technical in a pretty close way? Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I haven't thought about nationalism, that's really interesting. It has such a vexed relation to the British tradition. I mean, mostly, other than George Moore, there are no naturalists in the UK. Hardy makes for a very yeah, strange... Hardy, uh, I don't think I ever think Hardy, that they, they have a very strange relationship to... And, and nationalism, for them, uh, is predominantly... So la, fait mon coup, I mean, it's French phenomenon, mm -hmm. uh, which is, makes it problematic for an English novel writer, British novel writer from the get-go. Um, but I don't know, I think that's a very good point, and, and I just, uh, I'm not schooled enough in the American tradition, my Americanist partner rolled her eyes, so I ought to be my now, right? Uh, to say anything other than the completely obvious platitudinous thing about the heightened necessity for attention to the technical in the settler colony. I mean, I think that, that, that the easy and right, but also not very illuminating thing to say is that um, in, a, in a situation of uh, pioneering, which is why I think the attractive to Cooper, uh, in a situation of 
industrial capitalism in this kind of freewheeling way that the Seawolf documents. Uh, the technical, the manual seem perhaps uh, much more pertinent to life as it's lived than it might in late 19th century Britain. But that's kind of that. That's why Eric is up for so. Well, that's right. I mean, you know, there is also a differential reception history there about that and all. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah. Then in Jeffrey's lab also, I was wondering if you could talk about um, the contrast between the constable image and uh, the lighthouse. It was, it was Turner, 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 yeah. Uh, Turner, sorry. Right. Turner. Um, and uh, it got me thinking about the differences between a, a kind of technical sublime and a technical maturity. It's kind of aesthetic that's drawing us back to the real world term referentiality and detail and certain kinds of transparency. I'm wondering about um, the place of the sublime, I guess, in Stevenson's novels, which I don't know well. Yeah. And kind of how the sublime might come to seem immature historically um, based on its being tied to a romantic age that had yeah. gone and passed and didn't make good out of its efforts to re engineer yeah. the world. Yeah, that's. A really interesting question, and, and if you toggle back and forth between you know, this Turner and the image that I sent to advertise the talk, which I've said nothing about, but, but both of these occur together in Robert Louis Stevenson's grandfather's account of the building of Bell Rock Lighthouse published in 1824. And so, what's interesting to me about the initial publication context is. Uh, Stevenson's grandfather's desire for both versions of the lighthouse to be there, which is to say he himself personally commissioned Turner to paint the lighthouse so that he could include it in his book. Uh, so he uh, both wants to be recognized for a kind of technical mastery which was widely seen as unprecedented uh, uh, during its day, and no one had been able to do such a thing before, partly because well, for very technical reasons. The, the reef uh, that they're building Lighthouse on is actually submerged and uh, for, for much of the tidal cycle. So in the lack of, we now, I think, uh, uh, probably a, a wall would be built around it and the water would be, be excluded from the reef and they just build on dry land. But what they did was all the engineers were on the ship. And as the tide went down, they would get close. When the rocks were exposed, they would jump out and they would start working. And they would watch for the tide to come back. They would jump back on the ship. There was one point in which they almost all drowned because the ship was late. You know, building a lighthouse under those conditions uh, and representing the technical achievement that that was is clearly paramount in Thomas Stevenson's mind. Sorry, Robert, the grandfather Stevenson's mind. Uh, but at the same time, he wants this association with uh, romantic sublimity that Turner provides him with. Uh, I don't know if those two things, certainly for him, they're not mutually exclusive circa 1824, but can be complementary. Um, I think when we get to the 1880s and 90s, which is the, the Stevenson, the dates of the Stevenson novels and novels I'm talking about, um, the, even in Treasure Island, which for me is a kind of object of rehabilitation in this talk, you know, we ought to take Treasure Island more seriously than, it, than it's taken, even in Treasure Island, uh, the, the romantic sublime comes to seem a purely ideological relation to the world. And I don't think a technical sublime gets substituted for, I don't, that's, that is, I don't think of these moments necessarily as moments of sublimity, even in some redefined way. Uh, but they do seem to uh, stand in lieu of those moments where we might get the romantic sublime. And the passage of the Tigers is I've, I've cut out a big section of, uh, of a quotation there uh, where uh, this is from Kidnapped, uh, David is being washed by the tigers into, into Erich. But it sort of starts off in the mode of the romantic sublime, almost the Gothic, mm -hmm. and then modulates into this uh, technical commentary on what was actually happening. And that in miniature may be the pattern for the novels overall, just to say the systematic replacement of moments where a kind of sublimity that might be associated with Walter Scott, who sort of always looming in the background, and all of Stevenson, you know, gets replaced in a very deliberate and self-conscious way with something else, something technical, but 
which I don't think, although I would be very interested to be argued out of this, but which I don't think bear the marks of sublimity. You know, there's, in the technical itself, neither the kind of uh, Kantian infinite series, nor the Burkean sense of uh, the dwarfing, of the pleasant dwarfing of, one's, of oneself, these are the, 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 the largeness of the natural world. I don't think either versions of the 18th century sublimity or the 19th century sublimity come through. Um, uh, something else is desirable about the, techni the technical, which skirts the sublime altogether. Um, but I don't know if that is true with your you know, yeah, all those passages. Yeah. Um, but like I said, I don't know Stevens. I mean, I, I wonder about Stevens and I wonder about Jacqueline Hyde. And, you know, does that, uh, I don't know if that's sublime, but I don't know if it's technologically produced. Yeah, no, I mean, technologically Hyde is an interesting case. Of, I mean, I feel that Jacqueline Hyde is a kind of opposite number mm -hmm. to these books. And in Jacqueline Hyde, you get, instead of the value of technical mastery or technical expertise, mm -hmm. you get an indictment of the cost of technical mastery or technical expertise, which is to say, you know, um, Jekyll is not only a, a medical doctor, scientist, but a particularly accomplished one. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems as though part of what Jekyll and Hyde is about is um, making technical accomplishment something that happens both at the expense of, but also at the dangerous kind of feeding of these other appetites, appetites for, for sensuality or sexuality or violence. So you know, that seems to be a place where he's condemning people like his father and grandfather for um, everything that, that they didn't include in their life. If you, if you love the technical, you know, what, what happens to your friends and your wives? You know, but what happens to the human? These are the level of the technical. And this is like we're talking in our walk before this about an objection that apparently occurred in Germany to, uh, to the non-human turn. You know, what, what, what are you skirting or giving up? Or what, what happens to the human when you turn to the non-human? And I think Jekyll and Hyde might be an exploration of that and, and in a way, an opposite argument to kidnap or treat Yeah, Yes?
Stevenson's relation to the Dolce Roman. And, and so, uh, you know, there's been a lot of interesting work on the feminist Dolce Roman and the way in which um, women authors or any authors who take female protagonists in Dolce Roman as uh, something that they have to work through uh, necessarily have to change what's been a dominant European male tradition. Um, and so part of what I'm trying to do is to, number one, acknowledge that, as in Conrad's world, there aren't very many women in Stevenson's world. Uh, and there are a lot of pertinent things that might be said about that. But I think one thing that might be said about that um, is that that's not a misogynist phenomenon, but that that's a kind of phenomenon of, of query, whereby um, the, the inclusion of women in these texts would make them veer off into uh, a, a more traditional standard building room. And, and you know, this is where I can talk about The Riddle of the Sands, because in, in this amazing Erskine Childers novel, The Riddle of the Sands from 1903, it's about uh, this consummate sailor and uh, uh, his friend who starts off as this kind of foppish, uh, uh, frivolous uh, Londoner who uh, uh, has no genuine relation to the world. He gets summoned to help his friend and sort of sucked into international espionage against his will. And he becomes the sailor, and there's a moment where he says, oh, I hated this guy's ship before because it wasn't, the decks weren't uh, shine, it didn't have any mahogany, the scales weren't white, but now I see the beauty of functionality. You know, it's, it's a, he wrote it for me, he wrote it for this project. And the amazing thing about the publication history of The Riddle of the Sands is that there was no love plot, no heterosexual romance plot in Children's first draft. Um, his sister read it and said, there has to be a romance plot. And so he gave it a little one, and then his publisher read it and says, there has to be more of a romance plot. And so there is one, but it's clearly jammed on top of the real romance, which is between these two guys and their boat. Um, and so for me, it's very definitely, you know, query the villains reminds what I'm trying to say Stevenson is doing. You know, to spell it out. Um, two different kinds of agency. So it's really interesting what you say about the compass, but I would say the compass and the parrot are not the same. Um, the issue with the parrot is that that language that the parrot uses, which, which has a, uh, an exact use and pertinent standby to go about, uh, it's a command that uh, you give and it has to be followed, particularly on a large ship, otherwise catastrophe ensues. Uh, it, it blurted out, there is an automatism, but the automatism is important because it's blurted out out of context. The thing about the compass is, even though um, there's no human intentionality behind it, it's never, unless the compass doesn't work, uh, it's never irrelevant, it's never out of context, which is to say there is such a thing as magnetic north. And the compass is always keyed into these geomagnetic phenomena uh, in a way that the parrot's language you know, might randomly coincide with when you need to go about, but otherwise just is uh, you know, something that, that happens irrespective of the context. But that's not the compass. And so for me, this gets back to one of the questions from lunch, um, you know, there's, there's a kind of uh, non-human agency that the compass registers. There's a, there's a kind of uh, uh, non-human meaning there uh, which the compass is an instrument for recognizing. It doesn't create it or do it, but uh, it indicates it or measures it. And so for me, that's not the same as the parrot. Uh, on the other hand, clearly, there's a, the, I, I love the play on face, you know, the face of the compass, the letter of the sweetheart, uh, because one might imagine that faciality would be, like the compass, understood as a, a kind of... Um, a kind of signification which transcends intentionality. You know, you, you, you betray uh, expressions that you don't mean to, uh, you blush, and it's a great book on the blush, and the 19th century novel, this is how it was treated as uh, this uh, unintentional, even counterintentional signification. And the face of the compass is like that, where it's clear there's a letter of the sweetheart is something else. Uh, so I think that's a great distinction. I don't know what to, I have to worry about right. it to make it work. I don't know what to do with it. I just wondered if I'm a if the model of personhood you were saying that he was rejecting was for the for maybe and then what model he was offering, but he was offering a model of personhood rooted more in a kind of um, mechanistic or automatistic behavior rather than in a voluntaristic uh, autonomous 
No, I don't think, in fact, so, so this was the full length of this piece, it's 43 pages, right? So I read through 21. Uh, so what happens in some of those 20 cut up pages, other than Erskine Childers and, and the Sea Wolf, is a whole section on agency and a whole section on what I see as the, the twofold message about agency uh, that the technical teaches for students. And on, on the one hand, uh, your knowledge of non human forces. Uh, emphasizes human lack of agency. That, you, that the more you understand the degree to which uh, geomagnetism, radiation, uh, uh, gravity, meteorology, the more you understand the way in which the global planetary system, uh, not just to mention the laws of phys physics that you were involved in when you do something like trip, the more you understand those, the more and more confined and constrained human agency seems. So on the one hand, these novels seem to say, we have no agency. But on the other hand, the promise of the technical is mastery. Well, well to, the, to the degree that you understand how a ship works, you can overcome local and temporary oppositions from the natural world. And so I think that the novels flip back and forth between um, the technical is mastery and the technical is submission. Uh, and I tie it into, nobody asked me about this, maybe nobody knows the ebb tide, but uh, people who know the ebb tide always ask, there's a character who anticipates Conrad's curse. The ebb tide comes in 94, Howard Garvey's 99, 1900. Uh, who is this monster? And he's this Calvinist who believes that everything he does is sanctioned by God. And it seems kind of true because one of the things that he's able to do is he's this crack shot and he never misses it. There are all these feats of, of riflemanship that he you know, performs. And part of what Stevenson, I think, is doing with Atwater, his name, is to dramatize the horror of the, the, a world in which humans are actually omnipotent, the horror in which, of a world with no restraint. So that ties back to the comrade This happened, if I could answer no question. I'm a very intellectual at Stevenson at all, so yeah. just kind of following up very vaguely from Richard's question about personhood, which is not only about Scottish dialect and Scottish words, and yeah. I just kind of think the Ireland and David Lee is trying to get a, you know, a, a toehold in Irish childhood. Mm. I mean, what is the relationship between Stevenson and Scotland? Is, is there like a Scottish nationalist, you know, element in the story you're telling, or is that just not there for, for Stevenson? Uh, it is in Stevenson. It's mm -hmm. not something I'm highlighting, but uh, uh, kidnapped, actually, is all about the English manipulation of the law to oppress Scots. <laughs> and so, you know, the actual sort of straightforward message of kidnapping is not about the technical, but about the manipulation of the law for uh, ulterior motives, uh, partly colonial oppression, but also partly what's interesting about Stevenson, uh, he was a low lander, is partly about uh, tribal uh, 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 animosities amongst the Highlanders. So, so that, you know, ki kidnap uh, the, the, the Appen murder, historical murder, Stevenson retells to show how the English use it to further yoke Scotland under their control, but also how one group of Highlanders use it to get back and how the Campbells get back at the Stuarts. Uh, so he's deeply invested in that. And in fact, uh, there's a crazy moment in his life when he applies for the chair in history, Scottish history at Edinburgh. And he's utterly qualified. It's, 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 it's comical to imagine this. He has no training whatsoever. But when he applies, he apprentices himself uh, for months and months to Scottish history and he starts writing this non fiction history of Scotland, uh, which is you know, mostly about the Jacobite Rebellion, set in the 17th century, so the 17th, 18th centuries. He doesn't get the job. Um, but a lot of the work that he did returns him kidnapped as the Scottish background to the action of the novel. So it's very much there. And in a strange way, uh, you know, it's like Joyce, right? Right, he was from abroad. In a strange way, when he moves to Samoa, he writes more and more about Scotland. And you know, from, from as far away as the South Pacific, Scotland moves larger and larger in his imagination of what he needs to talk about. So yeah, it's, I, just, I just have time to be lighted, but it's actually there from few 
Donna Carter Fridges. <laughs> We're kind of you to stick it out. Thank you all so much for coming.